to a new video from Jörg, Jogler 66, Hour of the Truth, and Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. We are gathered here together to do the 14th session of the study we did to confirm that Jesus Christ was the complete and perfect fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week prophecy, and we are showing to you this by the study of the New Testament, which in itself is a complete and perfect testimony of Jesus being the fulfillment of Daniel 70th week. Now you can say, oh, there they go again. It's again the same subject. Can't they talk about something else? <laughs> yeah, we can talk about chemtrails. We can speak about Donald Trump. We can speak about Corona, COVID-19. We can speak about anything you want. But nothing is as important as, have a correct understand, as to have a correct understanding of the Bible, as to have a correct understanding of the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, as Tom calls it, because that's what futurism is. That is what the leading at the nose, I'd say, and that's a German expression, I hope you understand that, that you are led by your nose, uh, wherever the one who leads you wants you to, um, with the wrong understanding of the Bible and with the wrong understanding of the end times. Because that's our other study, yeah, reading Steve Wahlberg's book of the end time delusions. And these end time delusions uh, exposed, by the way, that's what's it all about. There is nothing more important than that. You can speak about Trump and Biden and chemtrails and 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 uh, COVID-19 and everything else until quote unquote the cows come home. That's an expression that I stole from Tom. That's why I said quote unquote. I have to I have to give the credit to Tom for that um, for that expression. But <clears throat> it will never give you any assurance of your being saved. And how can you be sure that you are saved by Jesus Christ when you know that you have accepted the real, true, only Jesus Christ, the one who is the Son of the Father in heaven, who went down to earth and went to the cross, spilled his blood for our sins, died, rose three days later again, went up to heaven and sits now on the right hand of God on the throne in heaven. The one who completely and perfectly fulfilled Daniel's 70th week with his quote-unquote visit to earth about 2,000 years ago. And he completely did it. And we are today in the 14th study of that immense, important subject. And after I did a rant for a few minutes on the introduction, I want to very much and very warmly invite my brother Tom Fress to the broadcast. Tom, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. A little laryngitis as usual, but we'll get through it. I want to uh, say hello to your listener, to our listeners, rather. I correct myself. And 
look, there are multitudes of things that we could talk about, but none of them as consequential nor as important as the subject that we've been talking about since the beginning of this of this program, and that is the 70th week of Daniel, which the whole Christian world has been told lies about, and uh, uh, this should be an easy task because the truth makes far more sense, and uh, we have the proof. Listen, we're talking about a prophecy. We're talking about Daniel's 70th week. It's, it's recorded in the last few verses of Daniel chapter 9, and uh, it predicts the precise timing of the coming of Jesus 2,000 years ago when he came to bleed and die and bear our sins upon his body and pay the price for sin so that we might live. And uh, we're told that that 70th week, uh, when Jesus came, is uh, not fulfilled yet. That the 70th week of Daniel, the seven-year period of time, is, is not to be fulfilled until the end of time which is just an indirect way of saying Jesus was not the Messiah. Now, don't you think that subject's important? I ask your listeners. Don't you think that subject is, is important? Look, we're dealing with a prophecy. Prophecies are known to be fulfilled if the fulfillment is recorded in history. Prophecy is history foretold. So when... God sends a prophet, and the prophet prophesies. We look, we read the prophecy, we analyze it, we, re, we, we, we remember it, we memorize it, and we look forward in anticipation of its fulfillment. And we watch current events for the fulfillment. And now we find that... Uh, the 70th week of Daniel was told when it would take place at the end of a 483-year period. It would begin. And the, and the total of the prophecy would be 490 years. So at the 483rd year, at the end of the 483rd year after the, the, the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Everybody in, everybody in Jerusalem should have been looking for Messiah to come because that's when Daniel prophesied that he would come. And those who knew Daniel's prophecy were looking for him to come. The only ones that didn't want him to come were those who sit in, who, who, who the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees and the hypocrites, the religious leaders of the day, you know, they're the same ones that have betrayed us today. The same ones that betrayed the Israelites back then are the same ones that have betrayed us today. They lie to us. They tell us lies. And uh, futurism is the lie that the 70th week of Daniel is not over. But the 70th week of Daniel was over 2,000 years ago. It marked the seven-year period of time during Jesus' ministry from, the, from his baptism in the river until the stoning of Stephen. And we have an infallible historical record of that fulfillment. You know, we don't have to look to a, to a history book. We don't look, have to look into Shaft's uh, church history or, or any of the other uh, uh, theological history books. No. We've got a better historical count than any of the historians could give us. That is the New Testament. And that's what we're reading. The most precious, the most perfect, the most important history book in our possession is the New Testament historical account of the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. You know? Historians today lie about history. You've heard that, haven't you? That we would be much, much wiser if we had a, an accurate reflection of history. The history writers lie. They change history. They rewrite history. 
They pervert history. But we don't have to worry about those things when we're reading the New Testament. And that's why God ensured that his book would contain the historical account of the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. That was the seven-year period of time when Christ would be among men. And uh, we see the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. That's what this broadcast is about. Now, once you comprehend and see for yourself in the New Testament, in an authoritative, divine, historical account, then uh, when your pastor sits behind the pulpit of the church and tells you that the 70th week of Daniel is future, well, depending upon how merciful you are, you can either call him a flat-out liar or you su should uh, suggest the very thing that we're doing and have been doing on this broadcast is take Daniel's 70-week prophecy, put it on a 3 by 5 card, write it down verbatim. Don't add to it. Don't take anything away from it. The exact words as recorded in the, in the authorized King James Version of the Bible and put it right beside your Bible and then read the New Testament and just check them off. Everything that Daniel said about that 70th week, you underline in your Bible every time you find a fulfillment. And that's what we're doing in this broadcast. We're going through the New Testament, showing the listeners line by line, word for word, the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. We are reading the historical account of the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, the best history book you can find on the subject of Daniel's 70th week is the New Testament. And we're trying to put to bed once and for all this futurist deception and give you the truth that you can defend with divine power right from the written word of Almighty God. And nobody can argue with you. Nobody can question you. Nobody can gainsay you. Nobody can call you a liar. Nobody can say you don't know what you're talking about. And from that point on, if they are going to continue to preach futurism, they'll have to do it with a shame face. But my suggestion is, Kick them out from behind the pulpit and go find you an historicist preacher and give him that space behind the pulpit of your church. That's what I suggest you do. And if you can't do that, then the best thing to do is to get out of that church altogether and come home, you and your spouse and your children, and a, a believing neighbor, and worship, and pray, and read the scriptures alone, with the Holy Spirit to guide you, then you'll know you got the truth. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I think even this long introduction, quote-unquote long introduction, is needed sometimes to tell the people, or to make sure the people understand why we are doing week for week this effort. And we have gone through a few readings of uh, Hebrews chapter 10 so far. We are going to continue today in Hebrews chapter 10. And I can assure you when Hebrews chapter 10 is done, we will continue with uh, something else with the analysis of uh, Daniel chapter 27, uh, Daniel chapter 9 verse 27, because that's something we haven't done yet. And then afterwards, we will still go into other parts of the New Testament and we will show you from different angles the fulfillment or the proof, the absolute proof of the fulfillment of Daniel 70th week by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. That's, in other words, what we are going to. Now, 
Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26 is where we st uh, finished off last time and I'm going to read that one again because verse 27 starts with a but and the but is always a sign that there's a continuation of what has been said before so uh, we are going to read Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26 and then continue in the new text from verse 27 on for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under foot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant here wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days, in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and, a enduring, and an enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that shall, after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall, not, uh, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the, saying, to the saving of the soul. And this completes Hebrews chapter 10 with all 39 verses. I think it was very important that we read Hebrews chapter 10, but as I probably said in the past, and Tom will underline that, the complete book of Hebrews is very important for the understanding, not only of the New Testament, but also for the understanding that Jesus Christ was and is the complete fulfillment of, of Daniel's 70-week prophecy as recorded in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Yeah. The whole book of Hebrews is therefore very important. Not to say that any other book is not important, but Hebrews especially. What do you think it is called Hebrews? It is a last attempt, that is how I understand it, and maybe, can Tom, maybe Tom can elaborate on that. It is, in my understanding, a book especially written for the Jews that rejected right. Jesus Christ, that were crying that he should be crucified and Barnabas be saved. It is a last attempt, or one of the last attempts, if not the last attempt, to speak to the Jews, to the Hebrew people, to make them understand that they have crucified their Messiah and that there is only one way to the Father and that is through Jesus Christ. Tom? That's exactly right. Uh, look, uh, Daniel's prophecy uh, was for the Jews, Daniel's people, it says, for Daniel's people, and Jerusalem, okay? And the gospel was not to go to the Gentiles until the end of that 490th year. And the book of Hebrews is offering still, after Christ had been crucified, 
for the last three and a half years, the spirit-filled apostles, those uh, possessed by the spirit of Christ, continued to confirm the covenant in his blood for three and a half more years until the very end of that 490-year period. So the book of Hebrews is critical to show that the, that the uh, of, of that, that portion of Daniel's prophecy that says there will be 490 years, that's seven weeks and 62 weeks and one week, okay? Seven and 62 is 69, and one is 70. So from the 483rd year until the 490th year, Jesus ministered and offered the covenant in his blood, beginning with his baptism, his anointing of the most holy, to his sacrifice on the cross where he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by, coming the, by becoming the sacrifice himself. The veil of the temple was rent in twain from top, of the, top to bottom, which that act alone in itself puts an end to the, the Aaronic priesthood and, and the, the sacrifices and oblations on Temple Mount. With that veil not any longer intact, there's, there's no way to continue Temple Mount worship. And that's why the Bible said he, he may... He, he, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. That's how he did it, by becoming the sacrifice himself. And then as a result of that, having made reconciliation to God, made reconciliation for iniquity, brought in everlasting righteousness, putting an end of sin, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. It's all over. No need for a temple. No need for a priesthood, no need for Temple Mount, no such thing as Holy Land. And as a matter of fact, God had already made provision to use the Roman Tenth Legion in about 39, 40 years in the, in, in the future to have that temple completely removed, not one stone remaining upon another. You think God meant business about putting the, the, the sacrifices and oblations to an end? He absolutely did, and he means it even today, okay? And all this talk amongst the Christian churches about helping the Jews build their temple, praying for the temple to be rebuilt, the Aaronic priesthood being reestablished, the Sanhedrin being reestablished, uh, 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 consecrating uh, the, uh, the temple, and the ashes of the red heifer and all the sacrificial instruments, the labor, the table of showbread, the Ark of the Covenant, that is all vanity. And it's worse than vanity. It is a direct opposite of what God intended. God intended for the, the Christ-rejecting Jews to go without a temple, without a nation, without a home, without a hope, without a sacrifice, without a priesthood, without an Ark of the Covenant, and they got one choice and one choice only, that is to receive the blood of the Lamb of God. Just like you and I. Or live without one. And now you have to at least have a glimpse of how wildly we have been deceived. The whole Christian world thinks that the nation of Israel, as we have it today, is God's plan for salvation for the Jews. God's salvation for the Jews is complete, and it's perfect. To return to animal sacrifices, is against God's will. It's delusion. The greatest delusion since the Garden of Eden. And your, your pastor teaches you this delusion. It's, it's one of the most emotional, one of the most frequent, one of the most rehearsed, one of the most repeated 
teachings in the churches today, a future 70th week of Daniel. It's taught in all the churches. And the design of futurism is to completely destroy Protestantism. That is the protest against the papacy. That's what Protestantism is. To protest the man of sin, to protest the Antichrist. Well, we don't protest the Antichrist because the Antichrist is the papacy and the papacy has been in this world for nigh on to 1800 years. And for Christians uh, prior to about 1805, 1810 in England, everybody knew the Pope was the Antichrist. Christians, Bible-believing Christians, were unanimous in their opinion that the papacy is, was, and always will be the man of sin, the little horn, the Antichrist of the Bible. And it wasn't until they began to preach this cockamamie futurism in the churches that be people began to believe this lie and the speculating about a future Antichrist and in one fell swoop it just undermining the, their own foundation, which is Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist, and now they don't have a foundation. The Protestant house has crumbled in on itself. We are altogether disorganized. We are altogether shamefaced. We've been laughed, laughed about, deceived, until we have no right to exist as far as the papacy is concerned. Okay? The man of sin wanted us destroyed. They declared an all-out war of, of annihilation against Protestantism at the Council of Trent in 1545. And that's how they did it. All they had to do is get the Protestants to believe in a future Antichrist, whereas they had always before believed that the papacy was the Antichrist. And they succeeded. They have succeeded. You can hardly find a Christian church anywhere in this world, Protestant, Evangelical, Baptist, you name it, you can't find a non-Roman Catholic Christian church in this country that doesn't preach one form or another futurism. Nobody insists that the papacy is the Antichrist. How can it be? How can it be? And that's why we can't, we're, we're helpless to change the fall of this once Protestant nation. Roman Catholicism owns Washington, D.C. Roman Catholicism owns your state house, and I don't care what state you live in. Look, Protestants don't have any authority. No one takes a Protestant seriously today. They just nod their head politely at Protestants, but they have no respect. Protestants have no respect in this country or anywhere else around the world. They have absolutely no power in government or society because they have made laughing stocks of themselves. Isn't it interesting, Tom, that they don't even speak of Protestants anymore, but of evangelicals? Yeah. They don't even use the word Protestants anymore. No, Very they're rarely. Ashamed. They're ashamed of the word Protestant because they believe the Protestant Reformation was wrong, that the Pope was not the Antichrist. And why would they believe that? Well, because they now believe the Antichrist is future. And it's only because they didn't carefully read Daniel's prophecy and they didn't see its perfect and complete fulfillment in the New Testament. And that's why we're reading the New Testament, to show them that the 70th week of Daniel is perfectly and completely fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Prince, the Prince that shall come. Just like Daniel prophesied, at the end of the of 69th week, Messiah would come. And he did, and he did exactly what he said he would do in Daniel's prophecy. And then the gospel went to the Gentiles. 
Now, if the 70th week of Daniel pertains only to Christ, and there's not one single reference made about the Antichrist, then the Antichrist is not future like we're told. The Antichrist could come any time after the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. Paul plainly says that he will come, but he won't come until there comes a great falling away first. And then that man of sin will be revealed. And we've told you over and over, it came at the fall of the Caesars. The power vacuum left by the Caesars was simply filled by the papacy. And now we're off to the races. 2,000 years of persecution and lies and deceptions. <clears throat> 2,000 years of burning the, sta the, the saints at the stake. 2,000 years of... Wars, wars, and rumors of wars. 2,000 years of a counterfeit Christ in the world ruling and reigning over the kings of the earth and persecute, together persecuting the saints of the Most High, confiscating their property, taking their children into Roman Catholic nunneries and, 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 uh, and uh, orphanages. monasteries and orphanages to raise them up Roman Catholic. That's history. That's recorded history. And yet, you still believe in a future Antichrist? How can it be? How can it be? Well, because you trust your pastor, your futurist pastor behind the pulpit. And he's your worst enemy. He's poison. He's lethal poison. And you've got to rout him out. That's all there is to it. I want to tell you something about the futurist pastor, Tom. Yes. As you probably saw on my screen, I was looking for something and I was preparing something here. And you were maybe wondering what this picture is all about. I'm going to tell you what it's all about. This is the PDF of a book from James Edgar Wiley that is called The Papacy. It's history, dogmas, genius and prospects being the Evangelical Alliance first prize on popery. This book is written by James Edgar Wiley of 1850. And I read this book in German. I have already done uh, 63 readings, I think, 63 or 64. Yesterday was the last one. And I'm in the general propagandism, as this part is called. This is on page 528 or 587 uh, or 551 or 587 in the book, so really to the end. And we were speaking yesterday about the Oxford movement. Uh, mm -hmm. I was mentioning the um, uh, uh, Emancipation Act from 1828. Uh -huh, yes. After yeah. the Emancipation Act came the Oxford Movement between 1833 and 1845. And then we have here a few quotes from Pewism, uh, which is very interesting. And if you allow me, please, Tom, I would yeah. like to read a little of this part of the book, because this is about the introduction of the wrong teaching of the futurist teaching in, quote unquote, good old England. Yeah? Yes. I that we just all know. Remember just remember what Yerk said. This was written by James Aiken Wiley, a, an English Protestant. He was a Protestant. He knew the papacy was the Antichrist. He wrote this book in 1850. That would be about 40 years after the, 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 the Protestant and evangelical universities and colleges in England began to preach futurism. They began to teach futurism. So futurism had been taught in England for about 40 years at the time of this writing. And people were waking up to the horrors of futurism, what it was going to do to Protestantism. And that's what James Aiken Wiley is going to tell us. Let's go ahead, Yerk. Yeah, it speaks about tractarianism. You know, the tractates yeah. they were bringing out. That was a precursor uh, of the Oxford movement. And it says here on the bottom of the page, track number 90, where the doctrine of reserves is broached, bears strong marks of a... I'm sorry, I, I didn't read it on, on beforehand, of course. I'm reading this for the first time in English now. Um, bears strong marks of a Jesuit origin. Could we know all the secret instructions given to the leaders in the Puicide movement, the mental reservations prescribed to them, we might well be astonished. Quote, unquote, go gently. We think we hear the great Rotan say that say to them. 
Rotan, for the people who are not familiar with that, is the um, second most important general of the Society of Jesus in the 19th century next to Bex. Bex and Rotan, they were ruling together for about 50, 60 years in the 19th century and Rotan was the one who took care that many Irish Roman Catholics invaded the United States of America. All right? So, we think to hear the great Rotan say to them, go gently. Remember the motto of our dear son, the uh, Sidivant, Bishop of Autun. Surtout, pas trop de zèle. This is French and uh, it means... Um, Uh, it means, it was translated here somewhere, I think. Uh, we only translate that into English, okay. Um, it, it means something, surtout pas trop de zèle, that means uh, uh, every, um, uh, surtout means every, uh, every time, not too much zeal. Yeah? Bring into view, little by little, the authority of the church. If you can succeed in rendering it equal to that of the Bible, you have done much. And now the sentence that I went on yesterday explaining for about 15 minutes what the sentence actually means. Change the table of the Lord into an altar. Tom, That's to make sacrifice. what does that mean? That take the table take where Jesus Christ was doing communion with the disciples and telling them break this bread and eat it this is my body and drink of the cup of the wine this is my blood for the new covenant and do this in remembrance of me they are going to change this table of the Lord into an altar and an altar is always for sacrifice That's this right. is a denial of Jesus being the Christ and the ultimate sacrifice of God. I went on for that yesterday for about 15 minutes, but I think you can do a much better job than I can do now in English. So if you want to elaborate on this, I think please don't, because I think this is really fitting in our broadcast today, right? Certainly, it absolutely is. This is Roman Catholicism is asserting itself in the Protestant churches slowly but surely, clandestinely, they are trying to change the Lord's Supper, which is a memorial of what Jesus did for us, and they're turning it into a sacrifice, a bloodless sacrifice, which is the mass of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? That's what they do. They change the they pretend to change the blood uh, the bread and the wine into the blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ, and they they change the table of the Lord into an altar. Now, what did Daniel say Jesus would do in the 70th and final week? He would cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Listen, I've made the point before. I've got to make it again. I'm sorry. The, 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 the most surefire way to identify an antichrist church is to see if that church makes sacrifice. Okay? Now, how far away from making sacrifices are the Protestants and evangelicals when they're ready to help the Jews build a temple to make animal sacrifices on Temple Mount in Jerusalem? How far, how much would it take to go from that to changing the table of the Lord in the Protestant and evangelical churches, the memorial of Christ, the celebration of our salvation in Christ Jesus, and turn it into another sacrifice? Look, if it's good enough for the Jews, it ought to be good enough for us, right? That's exactly what the Jesuits want the Protestants to do, to eat and drink damnation to themselves just like the Jews who are offering animal sacrifices. And they tried to do it in England, and that was the very basis of the, of, of the futurist indoctrination that they were beginning to spew from the, from, from the colleges and universities in England. Let me just go into there a little bit, Tom. A little bit earlier, a little bit earlier in this book, James Edgar Wiley says the plan was to get Protestantism out of England 
because if Protestantism is dead in England, it is conquered worldwide. Yes. That, that was their strategy. They knew that England was a Protestant stronghold, and if they could destroy Protestantism in England, then it would fall everywhere else. And isn't that exactly what happened? They sold futurism in England. They brought it to this country. It migrated to this country. It infiltrated all the churches in this country. And now they all preach futurism today. And the only thing they have left to do now is to change the table of the Lord into an altar and sacrifice Christ just like the Roman Catholics do. It's the conquering of the body of Christ. It is the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. It is designed to cause all of God's people, even the very elect, to eat and drink damnation to themselves, to bring them under the same condemnation that the Jews who have been forced down to Israel to build a temple and, and uh, raise up a priesthood and to make animal sacrifices again, and to reject Jesus Christ all over again. The Vatican has decided to declare an all-out spiritual warfare against the whole world. There's nothing the Jesuits or the Roman Catholic Antichrist would have us to do than to make a sacrifice. And that's what their plans have been from the very beginning. And uh, the, the, the ecumenical movement is all about that. Futurism is all about that. And here we have, in 1850, just four, 40 years thereabouts, since futurism began to be taught in the Protestant evangelical colleges, a Protestant writer warning everyone ahead of time what this is all about and who's behind it. And he's absolutely correct. And we can see the very same thing going on in this country today. Isn't it crazy, Tom, that this book is written 170 years ago and it is so temporal? It is so up to date? Yes. It ought to, it ought to raise some hair on the back of people's necks. You know, th th this isn't just uh, the rantings of anti-Roman Catholic bigots. This is a labor of love. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a painful thing to teach the truth. It's a sacrificial thing to teach the truth. But now you have another witness of the truth that we're trying to tell you. James Aiken Wiley, a Protestant writer, writing in the 1850s, about the very things we've been talking about. And the sentence continues very interesting. It says, elevate that altar a few inches above the level of the floor. Well, whenever there was an altar made for sacrifices uh, to the Lord in the Old Testament, in the Bible, I mean the Lord, the real God, yeah, not the God in Rome, but the real God, that altar was never to be on a heightened place. It was made out of stones that were not hewn by men's hands, put together, and that was an altar. But the heathen altars from Baal, from Babylonia, from all these um, heathen religions, you always have to step up steps to come to the altar. And here it says, he says, elevate that altar a few inches above the level of the floor. So this is already another sign that this is not an altar of the Lord. Gradually turn round to it when you read the liturgy. Place lighted tapers upon it. Teach the people the virtues of stained glass and cause them to feel the majesty of Gothic basilics. Introduce first the dogmas beginning with that of baptismal regeneration. Next, the ceremonies and sacraments as penance and the confessional. And lastly, the images of the Virgin and the saints. Especially show the nobility the elegant position which Roman Catholicism reserves for them and cause them to comprehend that the Church of Rome alone is in a position to resist democracy. Unquote. 
And with his very last words, he hammers again into Pope Pius IX's uh, encyclical and um, Bulla, the encyclical which was the um, encyclical of uh, the uh, the Eros. What is that called? Um, oh, you know that, Tom. I I forgot the name for the for the moment. It's it's, it's what now? Uh, Pope Pius the Ninth and his encyclical of uh, of the errors. The syllabus of errors. The syllabus the of syllabus errors. Of Thank errors. you. Yeah, where syllabus, names, not encyclical. Yeah. Where where he names all the errors of Protestantism. And the uh, and the uh, uh, accompanying uh, bull that was called. Um, I just had the name. Now I said the sentence and <laughs> forgot the name. Quanta cura. Uh, yeah, Quanta Cura, yeah, that went went along with it. So these last words are uh, a hammering of uh, the Jesuit general Rothan into uh, the syllabus of errors. The Church of Rome alone is in a position to resist democracy. Yeah. So whenever the Church of Rome teaches democracy all over the world, Tom, is that believable then? No, it's not believable at all. There's no democracy in the Roman Catholic Church. It's 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 a theocracy, it's it's a it's a uh, malevolent theocracy, the Pope being the God of the uh, uh, and the and the and the, the the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's a top-down autocratic that's leadership. Is. Yeah, it's a malevolent theocracy. The pa the pipe the papacy holds, as it were, the seat of God Almighty in this world. That is codified in Roman Catholic canon law. Blasphemy of blasphemies, but it's codified in Roman Catholic canon law. That is Roman Catholicism, and it has never changed, and all of its pretension uh, of being a dem democracy is absolutely, abjectly uh, rejected in, in view of history. Okay, and uh, uh, she can say anything she wants. She's a liar, and uh, that's that's the Church of Antichrist. This last sentence should wake up everybody, right? Sure. To comprehend that the Church of Rome alone is in a position to resist democracy. So if you want democracy, you cannot turn to Romanism, right? There's no democracy in the Roman Catholic Church. It is a malevolent dictatorship, a theocratic dictatorship. Always has been and always will be. If for a time it has to put on the, the face of a republic or dem democracy for the sake of convenience, it will. But as soon as it's possible, it returns to the, the, the malevolent theocratic mon monopoly of, of the papacy. Well, Tom, and, and that's what, what the papacy, you... What the papacy demands is a global theocracy of the Pope. You just described what the Roman Catholic Church did for the last 250 years in the United States yeah. of America. Yeah. Yeah, I did. They've just patiently bided their time until the time is right and then they 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 show their true colors as it it's was a, written in the book the ark and the dove right that's right it's the preparing exactly of the, the ground the sowing and the tilling and then yep. the harvest yep it's time to harvest john carroll told the pope stay out of america's business let the american roman catholic church bide its time and we will hand this country over to you lock, stock, and barrel. But if you try to get involved in, Ro in American politics right now, they'll kill all of us Roman Catholics, and there won't be any hope at all for the Pope to be God in this country. And John Carroll convinced the papacy to lay off, to keep his hands off and let John Carroll and the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic hierarchy, the bishops, the cardinals in this country, do their dirty work. They made the United States a mission, and slowly but surely, they have Catholicized this country. And now you see what we see today. And if you want, if the, if the listeners absolutely must have something about Donald Trump and about all the politics in this country, let me tell you something that you probably weren't going to hear anywhere else. 
Yerk will remind you of, of, a, of a message, a, a sermon, a, a lesson that I gave years ago about a grandfather clock. <laughs> and that yeah. we need, that the Vatican is the grandfather. Okay, the Pope is the grandfather. And the, and the pendulum on the clock must swing both ways for the clock to advance. The left and the right swinging of of the clock is what keeps that clock advancing. Okay, that is a, a pictorial picture of the Roman Catholic system in this country. The left and the right both work to to turn the papal clock. Not only in okay. your country, Tom, but worldwide. That's the way it works worldwide. That's right. And what you're seeing today with this, with this, what looks to be a civil war developing in this country is literally the left wing of the Roman Catholic Church and the right wing of the Roman Catholic Church ready to enter into civil war. Okay? I'm going to give some advice to the listeners. You can, you can take it or leave it. But don't get involved in this war. It's not your war. You belong to the kingdom of Christ. And you've got no more business involving yourselves in, in, in the election of a, of a Roman Catholic presidency, whether Democratic or Republican, than the first century Christians had at going to the polls to elect the next Caesar. Do you think Paul went to Rome to vote for the next Caesar? Do you think any of the house of God ever went to Rome to, vote, to elect the next uh, Pilate or the next Nero? I'm telling you, every candidate for president of the United States has been approved by the Vatican. The left wing carries the left wing agenda of the Roman Catholic Church. The right wing carries the right wing of the Roman Catholic Church. And when you vote for either left wing or right wing, you're voting for a Roman Catholic agenda. And they've come finally to loggerheads. They're about to destroy one another, and you need to stay out of that battle. You have a kingdom, you have a king. You have a constitution, and you have an inheritance. The meek shall inherit the world. And you stay out of this conflict because you're the meek of this world. You're supposed to preach peace. You're supposed to preach reconciliation for iniquity, everlasting righteousness. You're supposed to preach Christ and him crucified. That's your politics so that more people be added to the kingdom of heaven daily. That's your king. That's your kingdom. The Bible is your constitution, and you've got no business playing on the, on the battlefield with a Roman agenda. There's nothing Protestant about this government. There's nothing biblical about this government. There's nothing Christ-like about this government anymore. Roman Catholicism rules Washington, D.C., your state house, your county, your county courthouse, and your local municipality. That's a fact. Or history is a liar. And so is the Bible. Now, what are you going to do? Are you going to play the game? Are you going to play the Roman game, thinking it's your patriotic duty? Who are you loyal to, Caesar or Christ? That ought to be the position of God's people. To hell with Caesar. We want Christ, the benevolent kingdom of Christ. The gods of this world are about to be judged by the returning Messiah. What will he find us doing? Will he find us completely deceived by this Roman Catholic political system? Will he find us pawns on the papal chessboard? Or will he find us doing his bidding in the world? You can't play Roman Catholic politics 
and please Christ, I'm telling you. Get out of this idea that you're doing your patriotic duty to participate in politics in this country. You better comprehend what politics is really all about. You better ask yourself, would, what would Paul do? Paul would preach Christ and him crucified, knowing full well that the kingdoms of this world are ruled by the Antichrist. The Bible says so. He reigneth over the kings of the earth. So whenever you elect one of these papal stooges, whether he's Democratic or Republican, he's going to serve the Pope, the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. You wonder why they never seem to serve the people. You just don't understand your Bible. You don't believe the Scriptures. The Scripture says the papacy, the Antichrist, the man of sin, reigneth over the kings of the earth. You see, but that's hard to believe if you've believed in a future Antichrist all of your life and you've never once seen the historical Antichrist in the papacy. You see what a damage, what danger your, your, your futurist Protestant and evangelical pastors are? They've blinded you. They've blinded you. They've accomplished more for Satan than every bar and every brothel in this country by teaching you a lie, the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, that the Antichrist is future. It's not the Pope. It's somebody in the distant future. You've been lied to. Now, don't become so proud that you can't admit that you've been lied to and deceived. That's the greatest mistake you can make at this point. You have to humble yourself. We've been deceived. Plant your face in the ashes and pray for God's forgiveness and guidance from here on out. In sackcloth and ash, do what, you've, do what I've done, and God will help you but have no hope in mankind. Washington is chock full of mankind. There isn't a Bible-believing Christian in politics in this country. It's not a place for a Christian to be. The kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of Christ. That means they're not the kingdoms of Christ now, are they? You see what happens when you read your Bible? Instead of sitting there in the pew after checking your brain, your Bible, your coat, and your hat at the door and coming in and just nodding your head up and down with every cockamamie lie your pastor teaches you? Far better off that you read the Scriptures for yourself and let the Holy Spirit teach you than let a Jesuit train Protestant name only deceiver control your mind look it's painful I, there's no way I can sugarcoat it for you there was nothing sugarcoated about it for me but for the first time in my life I know the truth and it set me free now I'm free to tell the truth to anybody that'll listen. And you got to admit, you just got to admit, make your comments in the video on YouTube. Make your comments. It makes far more sense than anything you've been taught in the churches, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Be honest with yourself. Be honest with the Lord. Be honest with your fellow brother Christians. This makes far more sense than you've ever been taught behind the pulpit of your church. All of a sudden, history and prophecy shake hands. It's got to be right. You know, the truth always has a unique sound, doesn't it? <laughs> me and let us 
Oh. 